Good evening, White Marsh. I'd like to call the White Marsh Township Board of Supervisors meeting of August 13th, 2020 to order. JC, would you like to lead us in the pledge? Yes, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We can move on to announcements. Uh, Fran? Uh, thanks, Laura. Uh, the announcements for tonight are, the library has reopened for limited services and hours, Wednesday through Saturdays. Details are available at www.jeanslibrary.org. The census deadline for self-responses has been extended until September 30th, 2020. Residents should visit 2020census.gov for additional details. All storm-related road closures have been repaired and are now open for vehicle traffic. Help is available for Monco residents with damage caused by Hurricane Isaias. The Montgomery County Department of Public Safety has partnered with neighboring agencies to create the Home Cleanup Hotline to support residents in need. Residents should call 1-844-965-1386 to provide details that will be shared with volunteers from local disaster relief organizations. Common requests include help cutting fallen trees, removing affected drywall, flooring or appliances, tarping roofs, and mold mitigation. These services are being provided free from volunteers. Efforts will be made to support as many residents as possible, but assistance cannot be guaranteed. And then I'll move on. I'd like to uh, introduce Staff Sergeant uh, Chase Crump, who's with us tonight. Uh, Chase was introduced to me by a resident who had told me about um, a very positive impact that he made on his daughter at, at Plymouth White Marsh High School. And Chase works with our community. He's an army recruiter. And I thought we'd give him a couple minutes tonight just to introduce himself and what he does for our community. So anyway, I'll turn it over to you, Chase. You can come off mute. All right, thanks, friend. I appreciate it. Um, how's everyone doing? Um, my name is Staff Sergeant Chase Crump. Um, I am the station commander here in the uh, Plymouth Meeting Mall. Um, what that means is pretty much I oversee all the recruiting operations uh, for the area and the surrounding areas um, here at the mall. Okay, I have um, I have a team of three other recruiters who work under me. Um, you know, some of you all may have received some phone calls from me and me or my team. You know, just trying to speak with individuals about opportunities about the army and things of that nature. Um, a little bit of background about me. I, I've, I've been here about four years now. Um, I came out here in 2016 as a recruiter, and now I'm in charge of, as the station commander. Um, originally, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. I'm not from this area. Um, I've been in the Army for about 11 years now, going on 11 years, and um, I, I'm definitely loving what I do, and I'm enjoying recruiting and helping others get to, you know, the things that they're trying to do as far as education, going, going to college, all those good things. We definitely, you know, we're in the community to help the community. We are here to, um, you know, push people to further their education, further themselves in, in a career that is very, um, is very rewarding. Um, so that's just pretty much a little bit about what I do. Like I said, I'm, I'm located in the Plymouth Meeting Mall. If anyone ever wants to reach out to me or my team, we're located uh, here, and they, yeah, I don't know if you all know where the Bertucci's is uh, in the mall, but that's where we're located, right behind the Bertucci's, inside the mall. A lot of people confuse and think we're outside of the mall, but we're actually inside of the mall. So if anybody, um, if anybody ever wants to contact me or reach me, um, Fran has my car. You can, you know, more than welcome to share it with anyone. And if you all just want to come in and chit chat and you know about events or anything that's going on in the community. We'd be glad to be a part of it, and that's pretty much it on my end, Fran. I, I appreciate I appreciate the time you gave me. All right, thanks, Chase, and uh, thanks for your service. No appreciate problem. It. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant. Would you um, 
did he go off All right sergeant would you consider giving us your contact information maybe we can have that as part of our weekly email blast or some way to share your info absolutely um would you do, do you want it now or you can, you can provide you can, it to uh Fran. supervisor i, I can get it over yeah. absolutely Thank you. Thank, thank you. And, no and so, so, Sergeant Crum, I'm wondering what age, I mean, I know that obviously you have to be 18 to serve, um, but if there are kids that are interested, you know, 15, 16, 17 year olds, you know, should, should, is that a good age for them to come in and talk to people there? Should they be looking at the, you know, in the high school, the junior ROTC program? Like what, what's a good age that if kids are showing interest in serving the country that they should maybe get involved with you or get connected with you and the services that you guys have? And that's a great question. I appreciate that. Um, so and to join the United States Army, you have to be 17, actually. There you go. With the, with your parents, something. Yeah, absolutely. With, with, with your parents' consent, um, you, have to, you can be 17 years old. Um, but absolutely, I mean, you, you definitely want to start thinking about your, your future at a young age. Um, so 15, 16, if, if somebody wants to talk to me about the Army, that, hey, that's my job. I, I, get, right. I get paid to do that all the time. So I will, I will be glad to talk to anybody who is interested or thinking about a, a career with the United States Army. Well, I have an 11-year-old son, and I'll give parental consent. You can, you can have him. <laughs> Good give luck. Give him a few more years. Thank you. Yeah, all right. <laughs> all right. Thank you. No problem. All right. Thanks, Chase. Fran, did you have anything else? That was it. We can uh, turn it back over to you, Laura. All right. Thank you. So next up, uh, we have no public hearings. Uh, go on to the approval of the minutes. And uh, do I have a motion to adopt the meeting minutes from July 9th, 2020? So moved. Second. All those in favor, well, actually, is this where I make comments before we approve minutes? Words can make, the board can make comments, yeah. Okay, so um, I did receive an email from Eli Glick who wanted to make a comment on the July meeting minutes. Um, Eli, are you on this? I am. Okay. Would you like to share what your comments are? Uh, certainly. Um, after review of the public comment period, my statement uh, that I gave uh, is not at all reflected uh, by the meeting minutes. Um, I've said this time and time again. Uh, oftentimes the minutes do not reflect the context um, and content of what is spoken. I didn't say the word tone. Um, and um, I think that there should have been more detail about my comments. Um, what, what is here uh, is uh, inadequate and it, it really doesn't reflect um, the factual criticisms uh, that I stated uh, related to the, the tree um, protections or lack thereof um, at White Marsh Knolls. Do you want to make that statement again right now? About the minutes? About your comments specifically. Um, I mean, essentially, uh, I, I, I had actually hoped that when I wrote to you that you would have at least taken a look at the video and seen for yourself, uh, you know, exactly what was said. Um, I understand that the minutes are supposed to be a summary, but I believe the summary has to be accurate to some degree and um, uh, reflect, uh, again, the content and context of what an individual says. Um, I stated that through my various photographs um, th and through the uh, uh, motion that was uh, voted on and carried by the Shade Tree Commission, that the um, uh, Shade Tree protections uh, that were supposed to be put in at White Marsh Knolls did not follow Act 55. 
and they fail to meet the requirements of the ordinance. And everybody, I mean, this is not what I said back then, but everybody keeps saying, well, it met with the plan, but that's not the issue. The issue is it has to meet with the ordinance and it did not. Now what you decide to do with that, that's a different issue. I just want it on the record that besides what the motion is, is that I brought that before this board numerous times to show you that the protections uh, at uh, White Marsh Knolls are not being followed. Is there any board comment? Okay, Mr. Miller, would you please make sure that tonight's meeting minutes reflect Eli's comments and that he is wanting to state that the tree protections at White Marsh Knolls are not in accordance with the ordinance and that he that is what he is commenting on will do yes any other board comment any other public comment all those in favor for adopting the minutes as they stand Signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, motion carries. Okay, now we're going on to public board uh, discussion items, and I'm going to turn it over to Supervisor Drosner for comments and updates about the police department. Thanks, Laura. My, I reported similarly at last week's departmental meeting, but I think it's, you know, good to repeat it again here, um, you know, for, for at a public board meeting as well. Obviously, we have more people here than, than, than last week. Uh, I met with Chief uh, a couple weeks ago. We talked about a bunch of items, you know, may, you know and uh, able to accomplish a couple things in the short term and, and then have some medium term goals as well that we'll work towards. But, um, you know, as, as folks know, Chief Ward has been incredibly open uh, with residents that have reached out uh, over the past few months to talk about, you know, systemic um, injustice um, with, with respect to um, the, the criminal justice system and, and policing in general around the country. Uh, he's been open, he's had phone conversations, um, he's attended events at an appropriate distance, of course, as has the force, um, and, and they've been communicating really well with, with the department, um, with the public, I should say, excuse me. Um, so we decided that, you know, we continue to meet. Um, officially, uh, you know, we're gonna meet every quarter um, just like we do for departmental meetings. But of course, Chief and I, you know, can talk much more than that. We can talk whenever we want. And I anticipate that when issues arise or we receive emails or, or phone calls, um, that, that we can talk whenever we want to or need to uh, about safety issues and policing in White Marsh Township. Uh, one thing is, is uh, I, I can report, if you don't mind me, Chief, uh, we can congratulate the White Marsh Police Department for getting accredited once again. I think it's their 12th or 13th year, and they've been doing it since 2008. Um, accreditation is kind of um, a, a formal process you have to apply for and then be evaluated by you know, various chiefs of police, law, uh, senior law enforcement officers uh, around the state. They come in, they, they review your, your office, they, your policies, your practices, you know, to confirm that you are in fact operating at a, at a high and professional level. Uh, White Marsh Township, as I said, has been accredited for, for 12 or 13 years now. Um, important to, to stress, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, in fact, I think a few years ago, Philadelphia was trying to go through the process, and we had provided some guidance and help. Our, you know, our staff and our, our force had provided them some help and guidance on that process. Um, for what it's worth, uh, Conshohocken is not accredited. Plymouth is not accredited. That's not to speak down about the police departments. They are wonderful forces. I am sure they do a great job, uh, but it does show that we've gone the extra mile and done the extra work uh, to professionalize our force. Um, <clears throat> um, so, you know, I'm really proud of them, and I think we should all be, be happy that they're taking that step and doing that. Um, importantly, one of the first things that Chief Ford did after our last board meeting, um, you know, prior to that, they released some policies immediately um, so people could review them and understand them. 
um, he and I spoke and he drafted on his own a, a duty to intervene policy. We did not have one before. Um, in fact, there's not many around at all. Uh, and in essence, it is a duty on police officers to intervene if any of their colleagues or other officers are acting in, a, um, in an unreasonable or unsafe manner. So um, he drafted it, he sent it to the officers. I think they've all pretty much signed off on it now. So uh, we think this is a great protection for our officers. We think it empowers them. You know, we want it to empower both the officer that is maybe um, watching um, their, their brother or sister officer acting in a way that is inappropriate and, and empowers them to speak up and try to step in and calm the situation down. We also hope that em empowers the officer that perhaps has stepped over the line when they get questioned to realize, oh right, you know, my brother or sister officer is intervening Right. This was the, the, that's what this was about. Let me step back and reevaluate the situation. So I'm 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 excited that that he took that step and that the officers in our force uh, were more than willing to to sign and agree to such an important policy. Um, we are going to um, at some point, you know, publicly we can you know release some statistics regarding traffic stops. They're in the annual report uh, every year that Chief provides us um, regarding the number of arrests we have and tickets we have. Um, so they, they are, you know, available for, for public review. Um, you know, you know, obviously chief gets reports with each officer and, and what each officer does. We're not going to release that to the public. We don't think that's appropriate, but you know, if, if people are interested to in know how many you know, tickets there were, or how many people were arrested, you know, certainly that's something that, that we can, that we can release. Um, I think even more importantly, a topic that, you know, we've heard a lot about, you know, um, you know, as you talk to people is, is use of force, right? That's, you know, obviously what, you know, um, got things moving in this direction, finally, and unfortunately, um, following the George Floyd murder. Uh, and, and I'm, you know, we should know, I think the public should know that in 2019, we only had five uh, use of force reports. Um, I don't know the exact numbers in Philadelphia, but I'm pretty confident they get more than five a day, um, and perhaps many, many more than that. So we, we had five um, all year. For what it's worth, four of them were against white males. One of them was against a black male. Um, but, you know, it's something that I know people were concerned about, you know, how the, the, the department uses force, when they use force, how often is it used, who's it used against. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we can rest assured that thankfully our department our officers don't have to use force very much. Um, one other topic that, you know, we had talked about was kind of internal, well, I'll call it internal affairs. Um, you know, when a complaint is made against an officer, again, in 2019, um, there were only five internal affairs uh, complaints made, four of them were initiated inside. In other words, maybe one officer seeing an officer doing something wrong, or maybe a senior officer sees a junior officer doing something inappropriate, you know, the, you know, a complaint is made and investigated by the chief. So that means I think there was only one made from outside of the, you know, from citizens, from the public. Um, and again, that is certainly encouraging um, to know that that is not an issue that is ongoing here in the township. Um, I will continue to be a part of that process with, with, with Chief Ward. Um, I know people are interested in having civilian oversight, so that's a good role for me to have, um, to meet with him, to hear about it. You know, Chief Ward and his senior, um, and his senior officers certainly, um, because there are so few complaints made, they know what they are, and they can easily keep track of who they're against and whether there's some type of pattern they should be concerned about. But at least having me involved will allow me to, you know, hear him as well and just have some, um, you know, a little outside input on, uh, you know, what's going on and if there's any concerns that we as, you know, as supervisors need, need to know about. Uh, in addition, it allows me to be a non-law enforcement officer that people, the, the liaison role, I should say, um, gives me an opportunity to be a, a non-law enforcement officer who's available um, to talk to residents that maybe have an issue or a concern about the police department. Um, so if there are, if someone is scared to come forward and make the complaint, they could certainly reach out to me. I could speak to them, you know, privately um, to talk about the, the, the situation and see, you know, what the best course of action is. Uh, of course, at some point, if, you know, to file a, a formal complaint, someone does need to officially come forward, but at least they could come to me privately and we could discuss it. And at least I would certainly have that information um, moving forward. So, you know, we have a couple other things on our list to talk about, you know, over the next couple months. Um, it was a great, it was a great discussion. I appreciated Chief being available and being open um, and uh, look forward to kind of continuing this work. I think, you know, we're in really good hands. Um, our, 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 the culture at the White Marsh Township Police Department is strong. It's been that way for about 10 to 15 years now. Um, so I think we're in a really good place. But um, you certainly understand people's concern and certainly available 
if uh, folks in the public have any questions or concerns or want to talk about it. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome. Chief, would you like to add any comments? No, I, I, I completely agree with Supervisor Drosner. Um, and it's, it's a, as we move forward, it'll grow and it'll evolve as we need it. Um, you know, we're, just, we're at a starting point and people may have other ideas that we'll go through. We're trying to address the ones we have right now and we'll see where it leads us. Thank you. Well, I appreciate both of your, your time and Chief especially appreciate your openness and willing to have these conversations and explore all options. It's not like that everywhere. So I personally appreciate that. Any other board comments about this? Any public comments related to the police summary? Okay. We're going to move on to the review of the subdivision land development 1-20. Kevin and Donna McBurney at 4013 Crescent Avenue. Should I turn that over, Rick, to you? I'm going to turn that over to Mr. Dutton Plan. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure that I can share my screen at this point. You can. You can. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is a very simple subdivision. It's um, a lot line change, and I'm about to put it up, and I hope you can all see it. Um, essentially, what is occurring here is the McBurney lot, which is the lot on the right that I'm pointing to. And could somebody just confirm that you are seeing this? Yes. Thank you. Um, the lot line, which is currently in this location, is being moved approximately 28 feet toward the lot on the left, uh, the lot at 4009 Crescent, um, which will put the new line in this location. Uh, the two lots will be more even once this lot line change occurs. Um, currently, both lots conform with zoning. Once the line is changed, it will both still conform with zoning. Um, essentially, McBurney lot here will increase approximately 4,100 square feet, and the Tomlin lot on the other side of the line will decrease by that amount. They, again, will both meet zoning requirements. Um, the lot that is being made smaller will build, still be about 21,600 square feet and the McBurney lot will be 19,200 plus square feet. Uh, 15,000 square feet is what's required uh, for this particular A residential zone. No other changes are taking place. No development is occurring. It's merely the shifting of this line from here to here uh, in order to give the McBurneys uh, a more usable rear yard in this area. Uh, this was before the Planning Commission at the July 14th meeting. The Planning Commission recommended approval of the waivers that are requested and of the plan. And because this is a minor subdivision, it would be um, approval should the board uh, decide to do that this evening. It would be approval of preliminary and final at the same time. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, are the applicants on the call here? The McBurney's are in the audience, yes. Can they be unmuted if they are muted so the board can ask any questions? Can you hear me? This is Kevin McBurney. Hi, this is Donna McBurney. Hi, Kevin and Donna. Thank you for Zooming in with us. Evening. I'm just curious as to why the change. Well, recently we discovered that we had a 12 foot backyard and uh, at some future trying, time trying to sell our home with a 12 foot backyard would not go over real big, we think. So we'd like to have a backyard. We'd like to make it larger and 
make it more sellable in the future. Pretty Thank simple, you. cut and dry. Sure. So no plans for construction, development. It was simply to make a more usable backyard. Correct. Absolutely. Got it. Are there any other board comments? Is there any public comment? I can't see everybody here. I can see, Charlie, can you stop screen share? Yes. There we go. I'm comfortable to moving on, moving this on to a resolution. Is everybody comfortable with that? Yes. Do I have a motion to adopt resolution 2020-16, granting preliminary and final plan approval for SLD 01-20 McBurney 4013 Crescent Avenue for a lot line change to add approximately 4,100 square feet from 4009 Crescent Avenue. So moved. Second. Second. Mr. Miller, will you please call the roll? Mr. McCusker? Yes. Ms. Toll? Yes. Mr. Manuel? Yes. Mr. Drosner? Yes. Chair Nestor? Yes. Great, thank you. Thank you. Good Thanks. luck. Okay, moving on to motions. Make sure I'm not skipping anything. Do I have a motion to authorize the ordinance advertisement adopting the 2015 International Fire Code as the Township's Fire Prevention Code? So moved. Second. Mr. Meller, would you like to yes. introduce this? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Nestor. What we have is what was discussed at our Thursday work session meeting by our fire marshal, Nick Weaver. Um, as I mentioned, in Nick's role who came aboard the township this year in January, he was evaluating his department and uh, upon a lot of different and uh, challenging events that have happened so far in 2020, uh, he was able to uh, take a look at uh, our operation, his operation as it relates to the fire code um, and discovered some um, important uh, things that we are trying to get corrected. And uh, this is the first step in doing that. So with that, I'm gonna let Nick go over some details as to why we're taking this, uh, recommending this action be taken uh, so that he can continue to perform the duties of his office. So with that, I'll turn it over to our fire marshal, Nick Weaver. Good evening. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, the adoption of the 2015 International Fire Code as the Fire Prevention Code is necessary to enforce any fire codes in this town currently because the only adopted fire code on record by ordinance is the 1982 edition of the NFPA National Fire Protection, fire Protection Association Number 1 Fire Code, which is over 30, about 38 years old at this point and ticking. Uh, this was missed, not by anyone's gonna say mistake, uh, in the adoption of the Uniform Construction Code in 2004. Uh, a lot of municipalities across the state believed it was, the International Fire Code was part of that adoption. It was not. We do adopt, we have adopted the appendices uh, of the fire code, but not the fire code itself. Adopting the 2015 fire code will allow us to enforce a fire code in the town that's current, as well as being commensurate because both the International Building Code, which our building department enforces under the Uniform Construction Code, it, they reflect off each other and reference each other quite a bit. Uh, with the adoption of this, we'll be able to enforce it rather than making high, highly recommended suggestions to people and any future notices of violations and so forth would be able to be utilized under this. 
As for the second part was the inspection program. Currently we do existing building inspections. The fire code would be what we'd be enforcing during those inspections. The adoption of the building inspections and the program itself will then allow us to go to all these facilities and commercial sites throughout the town so that we can ensure the facilities are safe as well as keep an up-to-date merchant contact list and business list. Thank you, Nick. I have to say that that summary that you drafted there is really impressive. It was a really helpful summary of kind of where we have been and where you'd like us to be. So thank you very much for putting in the time for that. You're welcome. And it's my understanding that any fees associated with any kind of building inspection are things that will be, or the amount would be to be determined by the board at a future date. Yes, currently we have operational permits uh, that are required in the township by ordinance. And as mentioned, I put in the proposal, there are fees on the books right now for that but any future fees decided, this ordinance doesn't incur any new additional fees, so forth, any of that. Any action by the board will be required in the future for that, if you deem necessary. Excellent. Yeah, and from a safety perspective, to have all the businesses um, on a list for ease of access in an emergency, I think that's, that just makes sense. Yes, and uh, Chief Ward staff, at takes a list of this and they have the, can you please submit the form back to us? There is no forcible nature in that. And there are, I believe uh, the chief's list is about six or 700 businesses are on that and up to date. And when I receive things from different applicants, I send it over, but we have over 1500 commercial taxable properties at this point and more businesses in that. So this program allows us to get to know who's actually in our town, where they're at and who we need to get a hold of in case something goes wrong, such as, recent floodings that were occurring that mm -hmm. continue to happen. Yeah, a protection not just for the the business, but also for those going in to help any rescue situation to know what to anticipate. Absolutely. Uh, we don't know what's in buildings once the building department issues a UNO and their inspection. We don't re-enter the properties unless someone goes there for business reasons, such as going to a restaurant or purchasing something from a store. Uh, this will allow us to go in and build partnerships with each of the businesses in the community and make sure they're following proper safety procedures and what's actually in our town. Excellent. I see um, Chris Schwartz is on this call. Are there any comments from the other fire, fire departments? No pressure. I don't have any comment. Okay. Any board comments? Any public comments? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Moving on to uh, the next item. Do I have a motion to accept the resignation of Kate Johnson from the Environmental Advisory Board and thank her for her years of service with us? So moved. Second. Michael, do you have any comments being the EAB liaison? Okay. I just would like to say thank you, Kate. I know I served on the EAB when you were on and I appreciate your time immensely. I know they will miss you. And uh, we will have an opening then on the EAB that we will need to consider other applicants. 
sorry, Laura, my Wi-Fi went out there and I got back on and, and all I heard you say was, do you have any comments? And I couldn't figure out what about until you said that. So thank you for speaking uh, for Kate and for the EAB. No problem. Are there any other board comments? Any public comments? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, motion carries. Do I have a motion to authorize the notice of intent to proceed and bid approval based on the successful review of the 2020 road paving bid to Allen Myers LP for total base bid and alternate amount of $396,000? So moved. Second. Mr. Hirsch, maybe? Yep. Thanks, Laura. Uh, so we opened the bids for the 2020 road improvement project on August 11th. We received seven bids. Our office has evaluated them for completeness. Um, we recommend that the board uh, authorize us to issue a notice of intent to award to Alan Myers uh, in the amount of $396,000. That is uh, all items in the base bid, uh, along with alternate one and alternate two. If you uh, have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thanks, Jim. I don't. Does anybody else on the board have a question? Any public comments? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Jim. No problem. Do I have a motion to authorize the change order request number two to James D. Morrissey for the contract at Stenton Flower Town Cricket in the amount of $67,712.38? And by doing so, James D. Morrissey has agreed to withdraw the lawsuit against the township related to the prompt payment act. So moved. Second. Mr. Miller? I'm gonna turn this over to Mr. Hirsch to explain. Very good. Thanks, Rick. <laughs> uh, so I think as everyone is aware, this, this project, uh, the inter intersection improvements were delayed as a result of Pico and Aqua taking a considerable amount of time to replace large utility mains uh, within the intersection. So as a result of those delays, uh, JDM had to demobilize from the site and uh, they're getting geared up to remobilize to the site. So these, this change order is a result of uh, them having to uh, leave the site and, and come back and uh, provide temporary protections while, uh, while they were away. So our office has reviewed the submission of the change order. Um, we believe the cost to be appropriate and we recommend that the board authorize the change order in the amount referenced in your motion. Any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Thanks, Jim. Are there any board comments? Any public comments? May I ask a question? Sure. Um, in hindsight, would there have been any way to anticipate um, the, these issues with the with um, Pico um, and was there something that was overlooked during the the uh, RFP preparation process? I mean, I can kick it to to Rick. Yeah, to I, answer certainly, I can fully. certainly answer that. Um, there's nothing overlooked when you start digging in the ground, and unfortunately, uh, once. Uh, it was realized that when this was bid, uh, there was a lot of times when you go out and do a Pennsylvania one call and you mark the ground um, and you start digging, uh, there was either uh, the location isn't there or you start to discover um, other things in the ground. And um, upon that discovery, uh, 
a simple utility main does not take a lot of time. The problem was the amount of rock that they encountered in doing that uh, main removal. Um, you know, if a normal on a normal contractor can do uh, 400 yards of, of pipe a day, at this they were doing under 100 a day. Um, just to kind of give you a sense of the amount of rock that they uh, encountered and it just severely, severely delayed uh, the work in the project. So unfortunately, I, I wish that it was something that we had uh, eyes underground to see all of that. But, um, you know, with both Pico and then certainly with Aqua, the complexity once they had to relocate the, the mains um, delayed the project. So thinking about potential future projects of a similar nature. Is there something that the township could do differently um, to better um, investigate what's going in on under, under the, in ground, under the soil? Under the law, we have to follow the uh, PUC and the Pennsylvania One Call. They, the utilities are, are responsible for themselves. So what a contractor would do anytime they start any kind of digging, they will contact the Pennsylvania One Call system, which is a central system for all the utilities. They go out and they mark their lines. And once the contractor is starting, again, nobody could have foresaw that it was not so much that the line was there, but the amount of rock that it would take that long to relocate it and the amount of rock that they encountered. Um, the, the subcontractor who, who did the work, um, they didn't even want to be out there that long. Um, they were surprised at the amount of rock and the time that it was taking them. Um, a couple of them commented they hadn't seen anything like that before. So, um, you know, I, I don't know that there could have been anything to move it along faster. If there was, we certainly would have done it. So I, I guess what I'm asking properly, is there some sort of testing, geotechnical testing um, that could um, locate the rock that could have located the rock. Um, is there some way to, there, there, I would think that there's got to be some kind of test, uh, and I'm in no position to say what that is, that would be able to chart the location, the depth, and the nature of the subsurface conditions. Yeah, there's um, no, you'd have to, there's uh, absolutely tests to uh, chart subsurface conditions, but for a project like this, you wouldn't um, be doing that testing because at that point, like you would have spent more money testing than we just are spending on this change order. Okay, that's, that's, I, I get it. You know, um, that makes perfect sense. So you, you, um, you deal with the problem as it arises rather than four dollars into uh, testing that may not be necessary. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments? Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Do I have a motion to approve expenditures totaling $1,152,661.86 and payroll totaling $631,169.90 and pension paid costs totaling $7,577.52 for July 2020? So moved. Second. Second. Any board comment? Public comment? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Do I have a motion to amend the agenda? So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. 
Do I have a motion to approve the certificate of appropriateness for the installation of a roof, fence, and backyard improvements to 105 Black Walnut Lane? So moved. Second. Charlie? Thank you. Uh, I'm going to share my screen briefly again. The um, first, that certificate of appropriateness that you're talking about is located here on Black Walnut Lane. It is actually one of the older homes in that development. Most of that development is a 20-year-old um, development. This particular house was built in um, 1937. Uh, this is a photograph of it, and one of the major improvements proposed is a replacement of the roof. Uh, it is being replaced with the same um, shingle material that is currently on the house now. Um, a second improvement is a 72-inch um, or 6-foot stockade fence just along the back property line. And the third improvement is a fire pit in the center of the backyard uh, looking something similar to this using river rock um, around the pit and constructing it of larger river rock in the middle. Um, Harb met yesterday on August 12th, 2020, um, found these appropriate and recommended approval of certificate of appropriateness for all the improvements. Thank you. You're welcome. It looks like a nice fire pit. It does. Mm -hmm. Any board comment? Any public comment? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the certificate of appropriateness for the installation of a patio at 3049 Spring Mill Road? So moved. Second. Charlie? Thank you. Um, this is um, one of the new homes in the Maple Hill development. This particular one, um, as you hear from the address, fronts on Spring Mill Road. And what they're proposing is a rear patio to look similar to this. This is a rendering of what's proposed. Uh, approximately half of the patio area or about just under 500 square feet will be under roof and the rest of it will be open. The roof material will be um, standing seam metal roof similar or actually the same as is on all uh, some portions of the house now. This whole um, area has been designed by the same architect that designed the house. Again, this was in front of the HARB yesterday on August 12th, and it was unanimously recommended for approval. Very good, thank you. You're welcome. Any board comment? Any public comment? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Thanks. All right, motion carries. Thank you. Do I have a motion? Hold on one second. Wait, I forgot to add, there's one more there. Okay, do I have a motion to authorize the Board of Supervisors to provide informed consent to Kilkenny Law, LLC, to waive a conflict of interest with regard to a former attorney of Kilkenny Law, LLC, Robert Careless Esquire, who represents White Marsh Continuing Care Retirement Community doing business at The Hill, at White Marsh in connection with opposing White Marsh Township's petition for a preliminary injunction with regard to the Hill's use of the temporary construction access road. So That's moved. a mouthful, so moved, yeah, or second. Uh, would you John? like me to comment? Yes, please. Yes, um, so uh, tomorrow morning is a, is a hearing 
in the Montgomery County Court of Common Pleas in front of Judge Saltz uh, related to TACAR. Uh, the township, as the public well knows, uh, authorized the solicitor's office to file an injunction uh, to ask TACAR to adhere to the previous agreements and resolutions that they had made with the township uh, for uh, the temporary construction access road uh, to and fro the hill. Um, we, in preparing for the hearing, uh, we found out, uh, in going through documents with Mr. Miller, uh, one of my former colleagues, uh, a gentleman named Bob Careless, who worked with me from 2013 to 2016, uh, left uh, at my former firm, Friedman Schumann, and now at my, at my current firm, I did some work for White Marsh Township, including on this matter. Um, so uh, what happened was, is when we saw that, I, I didn't remember that it was from four years ago. Um, we brought that to the attention of Mr. Miller and uh, the chair, and it's our recommendation that we waive the conflict. Uh, professional rules of responsibility for attorneys are that if you worked on a matter uh, and you switched firms and you're still working on that matter on the other side, you're not supposed to do that absent a conflict waiver. Uh, so ordinarily you would just recuse yourself, but and uh, a new firm would be appointed and the Hill would have to go hire a new firm. We didn't think that, that was really in White Marsh's best interest at this point. And the reason being is, is Mr. Carolus's work on this four years ago was pretty minimal. It was four years ago. The documents are what the documents are. And what the township was really looking for, and Mr. Dampman and some of the other residents that are particularly concerned with TACAR and the township supervisors are, we'd like a court to decide this matter. So uh, going ahead and, and having Cozen, the law firm, conflict it out uh, would probably be, uh, delay the process a couple weeks. So it's our recommendation that the Board of Supervisors uh, grant this conflict waiver. Thank you, Sean. You made it much more easy to understand <laughs> than what I had read. So I appreciate yes, that. Yes, that was uh, that was Latin. Yes. <laughs> John, uh, the primary issues before the court are interpretation of the documents. Yes. Okay. So the documents are what they are. Mr. Carolus will not testify. I won't testify. Mr. Miller will testify based on his understanding of documents and uh, failures to approve amending those documents, which uh, the Hill is claiming happened. So that, that's what it is. But Mr. Carolus will not be a witness. Thank you. Any board comment or question? The only other thing I'd point out, I really appreciate Sean's advice here. I think it's the right decision. You know, and you know, it's just the, the limit, you know, that, that Mr. Carolus wouldn't have any the information he has is limited and is not controversial. The documents are what they are, and the, the court's going to have to review, you know, that that language and make the decision. So, um, you know, I certainly agree with the, the recommendation. Excellent. Any public comments? Seeing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? <laughs> okay, motion carries. Do I have a motion to authorize the township solicitor to intervene in Ambler Borough's petition to create an authority before the Pennsylvania Utilities Commission? So moved. Second. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. We, uh, late this afternoon, myself and Mr. Miller received correspondence from the solicitor of Upper Dublin Township, uh, David Bruman, notifying us that both he and Mr. Neil Stein, solicitor of Lower Gwinnett Township, on behalf of their boards, had inter intervened in this matter. As you know, Amber Borough, the uh, Department of Amber Borough, has uh, provided uh, service, uh, sewer, sir, uh, water service to uh, White Marsh Township. And now they are going before the Pennsylvania Utilities Commission asking to uh, set up an, an authority and of which there had been preliminary discussions with Mr. Miller and township representatives 
but we uh, really haven't heard anything recently. And we, we were not even aware this petition was filed for the Pennsylvania Utilities Commission. So we're just asking that the Board of Supervisors authorize us, my law firm, to intervene, monitor the situation, report back to uh, the Board of Supervisors on this. And why this is necessary is understanding there is a deadline to do this before the next Board of Supervisors. And Sean, how many, or Rick, how many residents do we have from White Marsh in this area? Sure, there's approximately 240 residents that are served by Ambler Water up in the eastern part of the township. Ambler Water serves residents that are in White Marsh, Upper Dublin, Whitpain, Lower Gwynedd, and obviously Ambler Borough. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, I'd like to make sure that you know, we're looking out for the residents in that area. So I would appreciate your office, Sean, um, having oversight of this. Any other board comments or questions? Any public comments or questions? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. Thank you, Sean. We are now moving to the public comment period. I would like to be in the queue to speak, please. Sure, go ahead. Uh, I didn't tune in early enough to catch any announcements at the beginning, um, so I apologize if I'm uh, bringing up something that's already been addressed, but I do want to thank um, Laura um, Boyle-Nestor for um, the comments that she made to Philadelphia Inquirer reporter uh, Michelle Bond regarding the township's interest in pursuing acquisition of the Corson Homestead, Abolition Hall, the, the uh, land and the buildings. Um, I, it's, a, it's music to my ears and to, those, to, to the ears of several hundred people who live in White Marsh Township. Um, we know it's an uphill battle, but we're delighted that it's a fight you're willing to uh, participate in. So thank you very much. And uh, the story, um, it was posted early this morning online, and I'm told that it will be in tomorrow's paper unless there's something um, of greater significance that bumps it off the paper. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you to all the other supervisors who support this initiative. Um, it is a vitally important piece of property in our community. Uh, the land serves as a sponge for uh, rainwater, and we need more of those sponges, as everyone knows, after last week's ridiculous flooding throughout the township. So I, I'm deeply appreciative and um, will do all that I can to support your efforts. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sadal. I will just say, you know, it's been a whole team effort here. Um, we've all been talking and working on trying to figure out, as I had mentioned, all looking at all angles, all aspects right now. We're in a unique opportunity to do that and we are taking advantage of that. So I thank the rest of the board and Mr. Meller and all those associated with working on this. Any other public comment? Yes, uh, my name is Justin Cadwell. Can I address the board? Of course. Great. Um, so I live at 4025 Cotler Drive. And the other night we had a meeting with Rick Mellar, uh, Fran McCusker, uh, and Krista with the developer for the Knowles. And I just want to say thanks for putting that meeting together. I know some tempers flared up. Um, and mine being one of them, so I do apologize. But 
Um, there are some concerns that I would just like to, you know, have on record. Um, we can, I can follow up with an email later on, but at least just, you know, I don't expect answers right now, but I just want to be able to address or put those concerns out in the public, if that's okay. Sure. Great. Um, first, we've had a number of meetings with Mark in our backyard. Mark Salomon is the builder, um, building the Knowles. And, you know, we were informed that at the meeting on 810, it was told that the basin and the grounds around um, the perimeter of the property that's being built um, wouldn't be finished until 2021. Um, it would be nice if we could have an exact timeline for that completion. Now, again, don't expect an answer right now. Just want to pose the question and have it on record. So, um, cause originally we were told that the shrubbery and, you know, any plant, any plants that were going to be planted would be done, you know, spring and summer of this year and summer's pretty much almost gone out at this point. So, um, next up, you know, what is the exact fencing going to look like um, around the perimeter of the basin? We've asked that a few times. Um, I think it's going to be standard fencing, but just would like confirmation of what that's going to be. I'm sure we can address that with the builder, but we'd like the township to also chime in if they are aware of it. Also, we've had a major mosquito problem due to the retention basin um, over the past few months. It's getting worse as the, as the summer drags on. We're getting more rain. So we're just curious to know how, how is it going to be addressed um, and will that upkeep be performed by the township once the development is completed since we are concerned that we can't use our backyard now just due to the amount of mosquitoes that are attacking us at night. Uh, third, um, we've asked for property lines to be redrawn. Um, the builder did do it once. They seem to be floating away with all the rain that we've gotten. Um, the reason why we're asking for these lines to be redrawn is because we're trying to do what we can to stop our land from basically washing into the retention basin. So we want to be able to plant certain things to maybe keep the land intact and not create tributaries that are eroding the land. Um, so just curious to know if the township can address this with the builder as well. Uh, fourth, work hours. Um, we're noticing more and more that the work hours are extending beyond 6 p.m., um, calling the police, I feel like is overkill. We've been told to do that in the past. Um, we would just prefer if the township and maybe the builder can enforce the 6 PM end of day, cut your work hours off. And lastly, <laughs> um, once the developer sells his interest in the property, who do we contact for issues around the retention basin? Is that the town manager? Is that, um, L and I? So just curious to know. And that's it. That's all I have. And I thank you for your time. And again, thanks for setting up that meeting. Um, it was pretty informative. Thank you, Justin. I have actually six questions that you listed. You're asking for, just to recap here, a timeline. Uh, what the fencing is going to look like. The mosquito problem, who's going to address it and maintain the upkeep for the property lines being drawn again, mm -hmm. work hours, and who to contact after the developer is done about the basin. Yes, you're right? correct. Yep, you're correct. Sorry about that. I thought it was five. I meant to say something. No, I was taking notes. It's all good. Awesome. So, Mr. Miller, uh, can we have a have those addressed and summarized back to Justin? Absolutely, we can put that in an email. We can summarize that and follow up with the board as well. Sure. And the rest of the uh, the group that attended that meeting on Monday. Yes, we can do that. Yep. Thanks so much. Much sure. appreciated. Any other public comments? So um, I was also at that meeting um, uh, for two reasons. One, because obviously I have been concerned about um, uh, the care of the trees there, um, which in my opinion, there, I understand that it, if the trees would be cared for properly, 
and the areas around the trees would be cared for properly, that would have served as a first defense for the people living downstream. The trees would be working as they should, at sucking up stormwater um, with all of the heavy equipment that has been rolling over their root zone. Um, essentially, it's like concrete on top, so they're not operating the way that they should. Um, with respect to one of the comments that Justin just made, um, I don't understand why the developer can't install all of the trees on the periphery right now, um, and at least uh, the fencing um, along the yard on Kotler. Um, there is nothing that's, that's there right now. There's nothing to protect um, anybody from falling in or as Justin said, from caving in. And again, the more greenery that's planted, uh, the more natural options there are for sucking up stormwater. Um, th this is a, there's two problems as I saw it at this meeting. One is obviously the knolls, but the bigger picture is the stormwater in general that affects White Marsh Valley farms. Um, the, the basin, if you will, or the bottom of the, of the valley uh, is essentially um, Kotler. Uh, and uh, Kotler, uh, I'm sorry, Fields. And Fields runs down um, to Pine Tree Road where you can see that the stormwater system is ineffective in handling the volumes of water that are going there not just with this storm, but with many of the past storms, manhole covers are blown off and water is just pouring out of there. And this is all, it's been progressively getting worse. Um, my development on Whitefield Drive um, has contributed, my developer, uh, which was Mr. Salomon's father, uh, tied in to the um, storm system on Jackson Road. So all the water that comes in off of most of the properties on Whitefield goes into Jackson. You have the hill at White Marsh, a portion of the hill at White Marsh goes into um, that um, drainage area into White Marsh Valley Farms. You have White Marsh Woods, which is continuing to dump water um, directly onto streets, not into pipes um, from their um, basins. One of them is right next to Fran's house and the other one is at the top of fields. And now you have this new development. And when these developments come up, we only look at these things in a bubble. We, we, we're not looking at this, what happens to the people down, living downstream. Um, and somehow, we need to start looking at these developments, not just how they immediately af affect the area from a stormwater perspective, but how they affect the entire area. And this area is broken and desperately is in need of a fix. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. Uh, you know, I have your comments about the care for the trees there. Um, I don't know if Jim has any comment to add to that. The other part that you mentioned about the stormwater valley in White Marsh Valley Farms in that area, I appreciate you bringing up because it's something that we have been talking uh, with the town, with Rick and uh, Gilmore about looking big picture. That had happened uh, several years ago and you know, the cost is immense. I mean, it does need attention and we are looking to address that at, you know, for the budget for the next year and ways to look at that whole area and how we can um, improve the stormwater management there. Uh, Rick, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, that, that really sums it up. Obviously there's a, a lot of uh, capital projects that have to be considered. Um, going into the budget season and those uh, can be considered during that time. Um, there's mm -hmm. been uh, an extensive amount of work that's been done um, in the late 2000s up to this point and there's certainly a lot of work that still needs to be done. Um, millions of dollars worth of work has been done and millions of dollars of work still needs to be done. So we will evaluate, the board will evaluate those projects and, and determine funding accordingly. Thank you. Jim, do you have any comments? 
Uh, I don't have anything to add regarding the, uh, you know, overall stormwater issues. As as Rick said, that's a you know, capital discussion. The the tree protection fence. I'll just reiterate again. Um, on site is installed per the plan that was approved by the Shade Tree Commission. So that's what we've been working off of, and that's what we've been making sure that they follow. Thank you. Uh, can I just? Can I? I don't want to get in an argument about this, but I just want there to be a clarification about what proper tree fencing is um, per Act 55. Um, if you have a tree, um, simplistically, the tree fencing is supposed to go out to the drip line all the way around the tree, the entire circumference. So if you have a fence that's leaning on the tree, that's not per code. Now you say per, uh, per plan, all right, I want to, I'm going to do a right to know and I would like to see this plan, but that's not what the Shade Tree Commission uh, approved. But going back one step though, with regard to the overall picture of the flooding, um, you know, these, these floods are man-made. We, we've caused this, you know, when developments are approved um, without the proper infrastructure in place downstream, um, this is what we get. Um, so, you know, th there's health and welfare and public safety that are at stake, as well as damage to people's personal properties. Um, you know, this kind of development, um, this ha we have to have a broader view when we're granting waivers, we're changing zoning and allowing development to take place like this that puts people downstream at risk. Okay, any other public comment? Can I speak? Yes. Mr. Dahl? I'm really not sure how to use this. I put, click the thing that says raise your hand. Do you see that at all when I do that? When I click raise hand? I didn't see it, but. All right, because I don't, I don't have a camera, so you can't see me doing anything. I just, you know, I clicked the raise hand part on this thing, and I thought you'd see me. But yes, I'm, I'm I, I use Zoom every day. Unfortunately, unless you look in the chat, that's the only way you're going to see someone's raised hand. So sorry. Okay. Not so I, I should type here. it in chat <laughs> if I want to talk. I'm trying to or, learn. Or just chime in and say you need to make. Yeah, well, that's what I did. But I'm trying to make it. You know, I'm trying to learn this protocol. Hey, anyway, it's all good. We're all learning this together. <laughs> Go ahead, Linda. So anyway, this is my comment. You know, everybody on the board knows my concern has always been stormwater management. Everybody knows my situation living here. And I've always said that to me, the biggest problem is, and I know Rick mentioned it, and so did you, Laura, is that, you know, when you get these developments and you approve them, and they're going to build a basin, and they're going to do, you know, where the water slowly drains out and it retains and all this. Problem is, you keep using the same piping system and the same place that the water ends up. And you need more of those spaces because you've taken away grass, trees, shrubs, you've made all this impervious surface. And now you're adding water to places that already have water. And ours is a perfect example with the school district. All that stuff that I got with the McCarthy Basin and all of that, all of that water goes, the final destination is into Miles Park and over to the golf course. Well, when other people use that same piping system, when they added the softball fields over at the school and they, you know, they did their due diligence and got approval from you guys, but all that water, only so much water can fit through those little pipes and they get overwhelmed. The weather is getting worse and worse and all this piping structure, unless you add new stuff, and different places where the water can finally end up. This is not going to be a problem that's going to be solved when a development says, oh, well, we're just going to make it go where we already have pipes and we already have the water going. You need more places for it to go. And we're going to have worse and worse flooding with these places because they're using existing systems. And it's just overwhelming. So I know it's a lot of money, and, but maybe we need to stop all this development then. That's my comment. Thank you. I have a couple of questions, follow-up questions on this issue. So I 
I did see on Facebook many, many videos and still shots of the flooding in the neighborhood uh, around and below uh, this, this development that's being discussed on Germantown Pike. I have, so I have two questions. Jim Hirsch said that the tree protection was installed per the plan, the approved plan. Well, we know that, that the tree protection wasn't installed per chapter 55. So why was the plan approved? If you can't at this point hold the developer to the chapter 55 provisions and you can merely hold him to the plan, then why was a plan approved that's in direct contradiction to chapter 55? That's my first question. Second question is uh, regarding escrow release. I know that there have been some approved escrow releases for this project. I assume since it's still in construction that there is, there are additional funds held in escrow. I understand that the release is tied to certain com uh, percentage completion according to the plan, but I think I would suggest that before any additional funds are released back to the developer, that someone take a real careful look at the plans, um, at the actual, the as is or as built uh, uh, conditions and consider very carefully the impact that this project has had and the cost and uh, inconvenience and grief that it has caused neighbors whose properties have been repeatedly flooded. And it's not just water, it's mud. So please take a close look at the escrow. And I would appreciate an answer to the first question, why were plans approved that do not meet the code? Thank you. I guess the corollary to your first question, Sidel, is were waivers requested and granted in the process of approving that plan? I don't know the answer to that, but um, it's a valid question. Who, who might be able to answer the question in the corollary question? We could certainly go back and look at the approved plan. Um, as far as I, I could tell you in walking that site that, uh, that you know, where the tree protection is, is it in conflict with um, our code? It, it is. Um, but that was not what was approved on the plan. Um, if it would change now, it would impact the stormwater um, system that was engineered um, and could have potential more adverse impacts on the adjacent neighbors, which obviously uh, we don't want to have. Why all that was done, um, that was the process, that was what was approved. Uh, that's what's on the plan. That's what the developer is building towards. Uh, as far as that question, uh, why, I, I, I don't know that I'll be able to answer why, but I could certainly see if there was any waivers um, granted. And the bigger issue is who's watching the store? You know, who, who, who where does the buck stop here with development projects? Ultimately with the Board of Supervisors, but there's, you know, clearly it's the staff that's there every day, 8.30 to 5, um, that is pouring over plans, staff and consultants. So, and the, and, the, and the board relies on the advice of its consultants. So there, there's an issue here that needs to be addressed. And certainly lessons learned as we move forward. Um, and as you all know, st stormwater management is uh, the overwhelming issue along with traffic congestion. So we really need, to take a long, hard look at this, um, recognize the mistakes, and ensure everyone involved that it will not happen again. Thank you. Any other comments?
Any other board member comments? I'd like to announce that we had an executive session tonight to discuss litigation. We also end real estate. And I'd like to announce that we had an executive session on the morning of July 13th to discuss litigation and personnel. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Good night, everybody.